Hello, and welcome to Flying Failures, where we'll be looking at the Delacna HZ-1 Aerocycle. The Aerocycle was a highly ambitious attempt by the American Armed Forces to develop a means of transporting infantry across the battlefield with speed, thus allowing for effective recon missions or surgical strikes on lightly defended targets, while also ensuring that troops could avoid obstacles such as minefields, rivers and gorges. However, based on the design of this curious machine, its flaws quickly become evident, as aside from its endemic safety concerns, the Aerocycle also presented various problems with regard to practicality during military action, and was thus scrapped before concluding the test program. The concept behind the aerial conveyance of troops across the field of battle is one that has a surprisingly long history, with even the venerable Emperor Napoleon, during the eponymous Napoleonic Wars, considering the creation of an airborne corps that would be transported by balloon in order to undertake an invasion of Great Britain, though this never came to pass. 140 years later, World War II would illustrate the value of air transport in a modern technologically driven conflict, with the D-Day landings and Hitler's infamous Blitzkrieg clearly showing the value of being able to deliver troops deep within enemy territory so as to capture strategic positions and split the enemy's fighting force between two fronts. Initially, air transport for troops was solely restricted to the use of fixed-wing aircraft such as the Junkers Ju-52 and the Douglas Dakota, but soon a new and more versatile vehicle became available in the form of the helicopter, as pioneered by Germany's Fokker Agelis FA-223 Drache. The FA-223 made its debut in the service of the Luftwaffe during 1941 as the world's first production helicopter, and had the ability to carry either four troops or 1,500 pounds of cargo into combat. Though due to the destruction of the helicopter's production facilities in July 1944 by an air raid, only 20 examples were built, and those that did operate showed limited potential. It would be after the end of the war that the helicopter would be developed into the primary weapon for troop delivery and vital cargo supply to the front line without the limitations of fixed-wing aircraft, with early models, such as the Sikorsky H-19 Chickasaw and its British license-built derivative, the Westland Whirlwind, seeing action during the Korean War and the Malayan Emergency. However, even helicopters were restricted in their abilities, being often sluggish and thus easy prey to anti-aircraft guns, while their operational capability in combat was more for the delivery of troops and supplies to the front line or for surgical strikes deep within enemy territory, such as clandestine missions against vital targets or infrastructure. At the same time, helicopters were not especially effective in carrying large numbers of troops over obstacles such as minefields, with the time taken to pick up, fly forward and deposit soldiers being slow and cumbersome when compared to traditional methods of avoiding or overcoming said blockades. It was in this capacity that designers in the American Armed Forces considered a way of creating a machine that was essentially a flying motorbike, and would be capable of providing fast mobility for infantry units in order to support major advances, while at the same time being able to neutralize the threat of minefields or other blockages. The man who would first consider the concept of an aerocycle was Charlie Zimmerman, an aeronautic engineer who worked for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, Zimmerman being an early proponent of creating aircraft that could be used every day, and thereby supersede the car as a means of routine transportation. Zimmerman had made his name during World War II through the experimentation of disc-bodied aircraft, machines with a flat profile that essentially turned the entire airframe into a wing, thus allowing for lower speed takeoffs and landings on unprepared fields, but an exceptionally fast top speed in flight, the most famous of his creations being the Vought XF-5U, also known as the Flying Flapjack. In 1946, he developed a basic design for a thrust vector propulsion system that could work with someone standing on it, with control being achieved by the operator shifting his weight around to dictate movement in any direction, Zimmerman putting together a prototype in his garage during his spare time, and christened it the Aerocycle. His creation briefly caught the eye of helicopter building company Hiller, who borrowed the Aerocycle for testing between 1947 and 1948, but after early trials, the firm became rapidly disenchanted by its practical limitations and returned it to Zimmerman. The inventor refused to give up though, and into the 1950s he continued to develop the project at the NACA, 
principally with a hoverboard that used compressed air for propulsion, the result by 1953 being the creation of a proven concept that caught the attention of both the US Navy and the US Army. At this point, the Korean War had just concluded, and it was evident that even with the development of nuclear weapons, conventional fighting with men and machines would still be an essential part of global strategies going into the Cold War, while also demonstrating the effectiveness of helicopters and vertical flight on the battlefield. The US Army, enthused by Zimmerman's proposal, considered that the aerocycle could be applied for use by reconnaissance troops, providing an elevated position over the combat zone and being able to move quickly into and out of enemy territory. Thus, they presented him with vast sums of money to continue developing his project, and soon Zimmerman was able to create his first prototype in collaboration with the Hiller Company, this new model being dubbed the Hiller VZ-1 Pawnee, which employed a ducted fan for lift. Elsewhere, Lewis McCarty Jr., another aeronautical engineer who had heard of Zimmerman's jet board, partnered with the DeLachner Helicopter Company to create a similar machine dubbed the DH-4 Helivector. The Helivector comprised a frame that supported the engine, in this case a Mercury Marine outboard motor that produced 40 horsepower, which would drive a pair of contra-rotating propellers with a diameter of 15 feet, while control was provided through a motorbike-style twist throttle for power and the pilot would once again use the shifting of his body weight to direct the machine. The landing gear on the first examples was comprised of an arrangement of airbags on the ends of spars, with a larger central float under the pilot, thus meaning the DH-4 could be operated on water, though based on its low weight and general instability, only the most placid of lakes and rivers could be used, the float system being replaced by a more conventional skid undercarriage due to its lack of practical merits. McCarty's proposed helivector rapidly caught the eye of the US Army, and thus 12 production examples were ordered for testing under designation YH-02, and would be christened the Prototype Helicopter Observation, though this soon changed to the HZ-1 and the term Aerocycle was reapplied. The design was also modified to increase its capacity beyond a single crewman, the new machine being capable of carrying 120 pounds of cargo and was fitted with an auxiliary 19-litre fuel tank thus pushing up the range of the aerocycle from 15 to 50 miles. The HZ-1 was also reportedly capable of a maximum speed of 75 miles an hour, and could operate to an altitude of 5,000 feet, though the Army was more interested in its ability to be operated simply and with minimal training, De Lackner reassuring the skeptical military observers by stating that a person could learn to operate the vehicle in just 20 minutes, like riding a bicycle. However, one obvious concern for the HZ-1 was the fact that the exposed operator was stood on a small platform only feet above the threshing blades, though in order to ensure the safety of the crew, a safety harness was used to stop them from falling into the radial arc of the propellers, but otherwise there was no protection for the operator in the event of a crash. The first tethered flights were conducted by the Army in November 1954, followed in 1956 by the start of a comprehensive test program conducted at Fort Eustis in Virginia, as headed by Captain Selma Sundby, a pilot with over 1,500 hours of flying experience, primarily in helicopters. Immediately, Sundby noted the inherent difficulty of learning how to fly the aerocycle, thus dispelling de Lackner's ambitious claims as to its ease of use, while also observing that the low-slung blades had the nasty habit of kicking up large amounts of dust and stones. Furthermore, after a cumulative total of 43 minutes of testing, two of the HZ-1 production aircraft crashed due to the contra-rotating blades intermeshing, though thankfully Captain Sundby was unhurt on both occasions, despite the fact that these occurred at an altitude of 40 feet. Regardless, the loss of two HZ-1s under testing, combined with its inherent flying problems, and the fact that the exposed aerocycle operator would be an easy target for snipers on the battlefield, meant the project was abandoned during the same year, with Sunbee receiving a distinguished flying cross for his efforts in trying to tame the unruly hoverbike. Subsequent to this, all HZ-1s were scrapped with the exception of one unit, which now resides at the US Army Transportation Museum at Fort Eustis, Virginia. In conclusion, the theory behind the HZ-1 aerocycle was exceptionally forward-thinking for the period, as with a more practical design, the concept of creating a fast hoverbike that could move troops quickly across the battlefield would present a significant tactical advantage when it came to both recon purposes 
but also combined assaults on lightly defended targets that could be rapidly overwhelmed. However, the technology was simply not up to the challenge of what the AeroCycle was hoping to achieve, and in the end what resulted was a dangerous and difficult to control machine that was not intuitive to regular soldiers, and the concept was fortunately scrapped before it could claim any inevitable victims. <laughs>